you can introduce Harrison. Thank you. No. Thank you, Dr. Katz. That was terrific. So we talked about what glaucoma is. We talked about how to treat it with medicines. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Arsham Shabani. And he's at Wash U in St. Louis, and he's going to talk about surgical treatment options. So welcome. There were a couple of things that uh, surprised me today. One was the turnout. I think this is phenomenal. The second thing, you know, we deal with this so much as a physician. I think it's one of the first things I think about when I wake up. And, and you can ask my wife, it's one of the last things I think about when I go to bed. But watching Amanda up there, it, it, it makes me emotional going through that. Um, I just, it's, it's, it's huge coming up here. That courage, what you've been through. This is why we do it. Now, glaucoma, historically, when we train residents, and, and you guys can attest to this, it's really difficult to get them to go into it because it's a difficult disease. Kind of witnessed by what you dealt with with surgery, it's one of the tougher parts of ophthalmology. But I love it because it's true doctoring. Our goal is preservation and prevention. And it's not something, you know, right now we, we tend to treat once there's an issue but we're really trying to prevent further vision loss. And we do have a lot of things in our, in our kind of armamentarium, starting with drops, lasers, but we're gonna talk about the surgical side because there are times in which that's necessary. I do partner with these companies. My patients are the reasons why I have ideas to do things. And then my job is to bring this to these companies that really their mission is to help make this disease more manageable. And I think without these partnerships, we'd be at a much worse place. So, I do want to tell you, you read on the internet, and I know my patients Google, I'll actually have them purposefully Google because I'd rather direct them to what to look at. But not everything that's new is good, and you do have to be cautious with marketing. But it's not disingenuous, it's just people do have to kind of highlight what's going on. And then we're really talking about this as a pressure-mediated disease. So there are other ways potentially to address glaucoma, but really the, the main risk factor that we treat is the pressure. And so that's what we're gonna talk about. Historically, I, I have to give you a little bit of perspective, and, and up until recently, we haven't gone a long way from essentially trying to create little venting slits around the eye to route fluid to different parts of the eye. And when you look at some of these older surgeries, they were pretty invasive. And, and for all of us, what ends up happening is when you have such invasive options, when most of the time all you can do is actually make the patient's perceptible vision only a little bit worse with the goal of keeping the visual field intact. It's a tough thing to, to convince a patient and even yourself as a physician that this is the surgery that you want to do. And the difficulties that we run into, it's usually not your fault and it's usually not your doctor's fault. It's a fact of the healing process around the eye. It's not normal to have the fluid, the internal fluid of the eye move to other regions of the eye. If you think about it, that's actually an injury. Your eye's job is to shut that down and heal it. What we have to try to do is keep it from healing too much, but keep it just a little bit okay to where now you're in a safe range. And it's a very difficult task. And so glaucoma surgery in general, when we think about major glaucoma surgery, what we're trying to do is lower the eye pressure by simply creating a vent. So it's just a vent. Now, there's unfortunately up until recently, we really didn't have a lot of great ways to standardize that vent. I could operate and create this trabeculectomy flap, which is essentially just a, a vent and, and then the suturing and the tensions of the suturing and we're adjusting flow on the table. I could do that surgery in the same patient over and over again and might get completely different results. I did something a couple of years back. I took the other people that work with me at the university. We, and we have some excellent, excellent doctors, some of that have been operating for 30, 40 years. And all I did was I gave them a couple of note cards they were each the same size. And I had them draw on the note card just their typical flap that they create for trabeculectomy. And I did that every day. And they knew what I was getting at because all I did was I stacked the images and the variation and even just creating the flap was so broad. When you look at it at the microscopic level, these are some of the problems that we have. We just didn't have good ways to standardize it. And we started kind of realizing that there's a lot of variations to changing the flow rate. So we avoid the pressures of one early on and then we have to sometimes go back and revise it. Again, it's not anything that we've done wrong. It's just a very difficult thing to deal with when you're dealing with tissue. 
And so there were devices that helped kind of standardize in some ways that flow through the vent. But the problem was they weren't really designed to protect against hypotony, like what Amanda went through, when the pressure is too low. And you know, unless you're trying to shoot for a very low pressure, by and large, it's difficult to actually achieve a very low pressure. So there's a good chance you can overshoot. And there's a lot of variables, whether it's just day-to-day -day activity, how your body heals, how much fluid your eye makes. It's not consistent amongst all, any of you. And it might, might not even be consistent between your two eyes. So there's so many variables in there that makes surgeries difficult. But we now do have, and uh, potentially two coming up, the in-focus microshunt is in FDA trial. The Zen implant by Allergan is currently approved and in use. These are ways where we're actually now making new vents. And we're kind of taking some of these variables out of the surgeon's hands, which in my mind is a good thing, because we're trying to make these safer. And the whole goal is, the safer we can make surgery, the earlier we can intervene. Because then the risk profile is just better. If we can address the disease before patients actually have vision loss, it's a much better world. And then again, like I said, that's true doctoring in my mind. Probably one of the most um, important advances in the field of ophthalmology and just in, in, in some of these surgical devices is the materials. And you don't need to get bogged down in what they're made of. But traditionally, we were using some of these larger tube shunt implants were made of silicone materials, and we still, still use them. There, there's a need for some of these larger devices, but the material themselves causes a lot of fibrosis, a lot of scar reaction. And again, remember, that's what we're trying to avoid. Some of these newer materials actually have much less in the way of scar formation. And this is already one major step in kind of trying to prevent your body from overhealing our surgeries. And when you look at, in specific, the in-focus microshunt, remember how we talked about vents and standardizing the flow? Well, now uh, we've actually found ways to, to make these devices small enough with the proper dimensions to prevent the pressure from dropping too low for a long period of time. Because that alone can actually be detrimental and sometimes can be worse than the disease. And so the design of the devices now is kind of factoring out this whole uh, subjective surgical technique that we had. They're not perfect, but we really are stepping in the right direction. And so remember, if you look, the cornea is labeled up there. That's obviously the clear windshield of the eye. You guys are well versed in this deal with this, but the fluid flows through the anterior chamber, which is where the fluid remains, and then we shuttle it to what I describe as kind of underneath the skin of the eye. So there is a covering over the eye, and we want to route fluid in that space. To date, that's probably our best bang for the buck. By that I mean it's our best way to get the pressure really, really low. But that's also the space that can have issues. And so when we use devices, we can minimize some of those issues related to the pressure dropping too low. The other device I want to talk about is the Zen implant. It has a very similar construct as far as the design is to limit flow and keep it from dropping too low. And I, I've said this before, but it's likening to a straw. If you have a really short, wide straw and you blow through it, there's almost no resistance through that. A longer, skinnier straw, as you blow through it, it provides resistance. So we can actually calculate, you know, what are the pressures that we want to avoid? It'd be great if we're not dropping consistently under a pressure of five or six. And we know how much fluid the eye makes internally. So then we can actually design a device, essentially a straw, in order to prevent that pressure from dropping too low. And when we look at this, again, the material is such that they're less um, fibrogenic. They don't allow for the scarring to happen. And we do have to supplement these things with certain medications. So your doctor might say, well, we need to use something called mitomycin. These drugs are actually, this one in particular is an anti-cancer drug, but what we do know is it prevents scar tissue formation. So there's still a marriage between surgery and the medications. And sometimes you need medications to get the pressure down. Because remember, there's also a marriage between the medicines that you take for glaucoma and your surgery. Just because you're back on drops doesn't mean that it's failed. And it's a tough concept to realize. And trust me, your surgeon wants you off the drops completely. But if we try to shoot for that every time, there's a lot of overshoots where we get the pressure too low. So this implantation is done, again, without having to um, make a large incision around the eye. And very similar to what 
what you saw before. They're straws that route fluid from the inside of the eye to the outer structures. And you look, you're like, wow, this is so simple. But it's the simplicity that kind of makes them elegant. And actually, that's, you know, there's a lot of work that had been done and is still being done on these devices that you can adjust the flow and, and you can kind of scale them back and you can modify them. Well, the more parts that you have, as you all know, the more things that can go wrong or that can fail. And so the simplicity, honestly, is, is what makes these fantastic. You guys have probably heard of MIGS, and so this is a, a big kind of uh, field, that a surgical uh, field, and, and this is probably what has now led us, you know, historically we didn't have that many residents going into it. And the future is so much brighter because of the innovation, and, and now we have more and more bright minds going into glaucoma, to the point where, uh, I don't know if you guys remembered, but was there ever a time when you had residents that did not match into glaucoma fellowships? Because now it's, it's happening. There are, there are more people trying to get into this field than there are spots to teach them, which is fantastic. But these devices, generally when you see this, it's called ab interno, means that they're placed through the cornea. So we don't have to go from the outside of the eye around the conjunctiva making large incisions. And there are advantages. Usually the tissue's not as disrupted. They're more biocompatible. And then the refractive state, so the, the change in the glasses for the patient, it minimizes that. Why is that important? People can get back to work earlier. There's more predictable post-operative visits. This is a huge burden when you have surgery. The efficacy, again, these as a class, they are not going to be huge, huge as far as pressure reduction, but that's also why their safety profile is much more favorable. And it's okay for them to have less effect on lowering the pressure, especially if the safety is better, because again, we can add medications to get them down to pressures that we need. And the rapid recovery is extremely important. I think in our society now, more and more people are active, and we are diagnosing things actually earlier on in the process with new technologies technologies with imaging of optic nerves, and, and it's important for the recovery to be uh, better. I'm going to show you what it looks like when we view the inside of the eye. So we use a gonioscopy mirror. This is a, a mirrored lens that actually allows us to look at what's inside. And, and if you look, I'll, I'll point to here if, if we can see it. This is the iris. This is the pupil. And this band is the trabecular meshwork. So what you guys were seeing before, that's where the fluid exits. Many of these devices are actually placed or affect this band of tissue, and it's extremely small. It's like trying to thread the tiniest little needle into the tiniest little IV while your patient's awake with their eye turned and, and nailing this little channel. But it's been remarkable what, where technology's come. One of the classifiers is whether we remove some of this diseased tissue or whether we put a stent in it in order to have flow go through it. And so New World Medical has a device called the Kahook Dual Blade. And this device ends up removing diseased tissue in a minimally disruptive fashion. The nice thing about this device actually for what we do is we now use it for research. So I have patients that need surgery anyway. This is tissue that we would have discarded. We can now collect that and study in the laboratory and hopefully years down the line come up with either new therapeutics or new ways to modify some of these disease processes. When you look at these devices, just think about the manufacturing that has to go into place to allow a device to be this small and robust and still work in the eye. You know, we look at the eye through a microscope. Uh, there's not a lot of fields in medicine that look for individual cells in a live patient in order to make changes in therapy or diagnose disease. It's a very complex organ, and we look at it ad nauseum. And now these devices are kind of meeting that need where we needed devices that were small enough and safe enough to work in that space. So one of them is the eye stem. This was probably what we call our, our landmark MIGS device because really the whole field moved forward with this device. It was a prior generation, but look how small the device has to be to fit in just that small corner of the eye. And most of the time, your physician can't even see that it's there unless they specifically look for it with a special mirror. And these implants, the other good thing to remember that if you get them, the ones that are out there now being commercially used, they're okay for MRI use. So we get that question a lot, you know, can I have a scan down the line? It's fine. But these devices are now upping the safety. And before, we had other avenues that were more traumatic 
to address this disease at this trabecular meshwork level. And these devices now make it more consistent and safer. Let me show you some clinical pictures of what happens. So this is the, the I'm gonna point to this screen again here. This is the iris here. This is the limbus, so it's the point where the cornea, which is the clear part on top, meets the white of the eye. And these vessels you'll see in, in patient's eyes. What we're doing here during surgery is we can raise or lower the pressure inside the eye. And what I'm looking for are areas where these collector channels reside. So the collector channels move the fluid from that trabecular meshwork area, it goes into another canal, and then they leave through exit pathways. What I'm trying to do is now place stents in those regions. So when we raise and lower the pressure, you can see that there's not a lot of difference. I've outlined what we've identified as a collector channel. There's not a lot of difference in flow. If we raise the pressure, we should see some of that blood clear out and kind of flush the system. Now we're gonna place a stent in that area. We drop the pressure, and now you have that blood from the veins coming back in toward the eye. We start clearing the blood, and look how within a matter of a second or two, it immediately clears that channel. So that stent is trying to enhance your natural outflow pathway. And the limitations are knowing where to place them. They're not easy to find how to optimize them. And then how your plumbing works. So we can address the disease at the trabecular meshwork, that small band of pigment that you saw. But right now we can't work on these collector channels because if the plumbing below your drain is really narrow, your pressure is not gonna come down regardless of what we do working at the drain level. But there are fantastic options for patients earlier on in the disease course. And, and that's what's changing is we're able to tackle this earlier than what we did before. Another device, it's a larger stent that goes in to that same region. And the goal is for this to stent a larger portion of that area. And this is the device implanted into that angle. And again, it's a good thing to have these options. And it's a good thing for your surgeon to kind of know about some of these options. But whether you have one or the other, I think it's debatable as to which one. But this is the point of where the field has been moving. There's so much innovation here which we had not seen before. I think the future, and it's already being worked on, is drug delivery. The next level is really going to be able to monitor pressures to where it can limit the amount of times you come to see your physician. And you can monitor at home. We have a, the tiniest snapshot of what goes on in your day-to-day -day life. And the other struggle is, that's also the only snapshot that you have. You come in, you check a pressure, and you hang on to that number. But we all know that there's a huge variation in what that number can be the next time you go in and you check. And that's what's difficult for us. That's what's difficult for you. It causes us anxiety too. And it makes our treatment decisions very difficult. But I think down the line when we have ways to where patients are more in control of their own disease state, I think that's really the future. And, and there's a lot of different ways that we can try to implement this. But I really, really want to thank you guys for being here. I think it's fantastic. You have no idea how much we think about our patients day to day. And, um, and I do applaud the Glaucoma Research Foundation for putting this on. Along with these sponsors. Thank you. Thank you.